I'm Sean Kidney from Climate Bonds Initiative. Just going to wait till we get a, enough people logging on. You can see the numbers and the participants slowly but surely going up. This is a last minute webinar where the recording will be available on YouTube. In fact, it's been broadcast live on YouTube, but it will be available afterwards on YouTube to share with um, colleagues that you think would be interested in this. Um, we, we knew it was last minute for various reasons, uh, so we're not expecting a huge crowd today, but we thank you so much for joining us to add a little bit of that and put the frisson so that Danchi can uh, make it exciting for us with a live performance. Um, and I think we're just about ready to start. So just to repeat myself again, this is the EU Platform on Sustainable Finance webinar on the draft advice on minimum safeguards. I would like to introduce, this is always my joy, always my pleasure and always my fun, introduce my old friend, well, he's not that old, but my friend, Nathan Fabian, who doubles up as the Chief Responsible Investment Officer at the Principles for Responsible Investment, but is, for the purposes of today, the chairperson of the European platform on sustainable finance that uh, I've had such a pleasure to be part of over the last couple of years, goodness me. Nathan, over to you. Thank you, Sean. Great to see you. And thank you to Climate Bonds Initiative for supporting our launch of our draft report today. We appreciate the ongoing support of you and your team. And if I might just welcome everyone who's joined us live. And of course, those watching the recording afterwards, uh, this is our webinar to uh, share our draft advice on the minimum safeguards in the EU taxonomy. Today, we'll be explaining the advice that the Platform on Sustainable Finance proposes to provide the European Commission on implementing the minimum safeguards in practice. Now, it's important to say minimum safeguards are already part of the taxonomy regulation. They're not dependent on any future social taxonomy. Therefore, all taxonomy alignment disclosures, both by corporations and by financial market participants, must address the minimum safeguards. Now, you'll hear a lot of detail about this today, but very briefly, in the taxonomy regulation, minimum safeguards includes the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, including the principles and rights set out in the eight fundamental conventions identified in the Declaration of the International Labour Organization on fundamental principles and rights at work, and of course, the International Bill of Human Rights. Now, when it comes to minimum safeguards in the taxonomy, the platform's advice is that implementation steps and actions taken in practice to address the safeguards is what matters. And this is what matters when it comes to claiming that a financial product is sustainable. Now, our aim today is to inform you on the approach the platform is taking and to open a feedback period on the proposals. Now, feedback is welcome until the 22nd of August, and the link for the feedback is available on the Platform on Sustainable Finance website. Now, we realise that some will find this period short uh, for feedback, but we need to honour this timeline so we can complete the advice to the Commission by the end of the platform's current mandate at the end of September. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guests for the webinar. Uh, Antje Schneeweiss is the rapporteur of our subgroup four uh, who has been leading this work. Uh, Antje is also the general secretary of the Church Investors Group of Germany. And Ancha will be describing the role of minimum safeguards in the EU taxonomy, the general outline of the platform's advice on minimum safeguards, and of course, the next steps that we will take to finalise this work. She will later be joined by Senior Anderson Liskard, who is Strategic Advisor at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And importantly, Senior is also a member of the platform. Senior will describe uh, the uh, the background and explanation of the advice on human rights specifically. And finally, we'll have Wolfgang Kuhn. Uh, Wolfgang is a consultant for the GRI in his day job, but he's also one of our additional experts within the platform. And he will provide background and explanation of the advice on corruption, tax avoidance, and fair competition. <laughs> 
And with that, Ansha, I'll pass over to you to commence the presentation. Yeah, thank you to you, Nathan and, and Sean, for introducing us and making this uh, webinar possible, uh, even if it was at short, no short notice. And I would like now to uh, guide you through our advice, which we give in the report, which you can find on the platform's website from today on. So, um, first of all, I would like to uh, explain the role of the minimum safeguards within um, the taxonomy regulation. Um, as you uh, might know, there are three conditions to being taxonomy aligned. The first two conditions focus on the activity. Uh, that means that the activity has to make a substantial contribution to one of the six environmental objectives in the taxonomy regulation. And at the same time, the activity um, must not do any significant harm to any of the other five environmental objectives. Then there is a third condition on social and governance issue. And this condition actually focuses and applies to the undertaking, which is carrying out the activity and not only to the activity itself. This is a big difference to the first two conditions. So it's a whole company undertaking which is carrying out these activities which has to comply with the minimum safeguards. So content wise what are the minimum safeguards? Mm, the standards which are mentioned in article 18, there are two articles in the uh, taxonomy regulations which uh, uh, mention minimum safeguards, article 3 where it says that uh, the undertaking should comply and article 18 where standards are spelled out a bit further. And these standards are the UN guiding principles, the OECD guidelines, the ILO fundamental principles and rights at work and the International Bill of Human Rights. The first thing we did uh, in the subgroup was to sort out the topics which these documents actually contain and to look which topics are relevant for the minimum safeguards. And we found four of them. First of all, the human rights, including workers' rights and consumers' rights. And second, we had a look at the topics uh, put, taken up by the OECD guidelines, and these are First of all, also human rights, but these are already covered by uh, the UN guiding principles. But we also find bribery and corruption, taxation, meaning tax fraud and tax avoidance, and fair competition. So it's these four topics which are relevant for the minimum safeguards. The second step we did made was to have a look at the regulatory environment. We know that there are a lot of regulations on sustainability coming up and especially sustainability and uh, the financial markets. And um, we took some care um, to look closely at it and to make it not even more complicated, but to make our recommendation fit into the already existing or at the moment upcoming regulation. This was quite easy when it came to the SFDR because there is already a direct link between the article taxonomy regulation article 18.2, um, which says that there should be a link to the do no significant harm requirements uh, of the SFDR. We, our advice and we interpret this in this way that we say um, the mandatory social principle adverse impacts in the SFDR um, actually should be covered by the minimum safeguards. Uh, and they are actually, apart from one, they are already covered because um, mandatory social principle adverse impacts are already on the OECD guidelines. Um, they are, are actually, um, um, they, 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 are, they are on discrimination, uh, gender discrimination, which can be said that that should be, would be a violation of human rights. So they are already covered in what we have um, focused at in our four topics. There's only one which is not covered by the Article 18 documents otherwise, which is um, the PRI on controversial weapons. And here we say that companies which uh, produce controversial weapons as defined by the SFRD, uh, actually, mm, SFDR, <laughs> uh, actually um, are not, cannot, will not be able to um, count their activities as taxonomy aligned. 
Then we have the uh, CSDDD directive, which is the European Due Diligence um, uh, Directive. Um, and here we say as the CSDDD is built on the same documents as the minimal safeguards, which are UNGARDING principles, OECD guidelines, um, this can actually be used as a proxy for compliance with minimum safeguards if it actually stays as it is at the moment, which is that the proposal is built on the UN guiding principles. Um, uh, so we could use that as a proxy. The CSRD comes in because it actually will provide the disclosures necessary for compliance with the CSDDD. So here we will see whether a company actually has actually implemented the six steps of the UN guiding principles. We see what information it provides on identifying a human right risk. And we see whether there have been fines which have had to be paid by the companies on violation, for violations. Then there is a, an aspect of the taxonomy regulations which we on which we had a quite close look, and that is that auditors or certifiers will ver verify the compliance with the minimum safeguards. Here we um, actually gave the advice that auditors need um, more knowledge as they have today uh, on human rights due diligence. They will have to have background knowledge on human rights risks. Um, they should have a look at um, whether a company has allocated enough resources to uh, the human rights due diligence processes it's implementing and so on. So we give some advice for auditors as well. So now I'm coming to the core and heart of our advice. Um, this is this two-pronged approach to compliance with human minimum safeguards. On the one hand, we say we have to have to have a look at the due of the implementation of the due diligence processes of a company. On the other hand, we say we need some checks on outcomes as well, some external checks independent of the company. So the first, in the first part, we say. Here we see as indicators compliance with the CSDDD once it's in place, and the CSRD reporting will provide information on that. Uh, for non-EU companies, we suggest to have a look at the World Benchmark Alliance, and especially the core UNGP indicators here, and see whether a company actually fulfills them. Um, on checks on outcome and out external checks of whether a company actually is compliant with minimum safeguards, we suggest that there should be no final conviction in court on relevant cases. A company should not refuse to enter in a dialogue with an OECP national contact point. And there should be no not responding to concerns taken up by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, these external checks might look a bit like what is done already today and what is common practice on minimum safeguards and other human rights violations by companies, which is controversy screening. We don't call it like this and our suggestion actually go a bit beyond that. This is because First of all, we see that the documents in Article 18 focus on due diligence processes implemented by the company itself. The um, Article 8, 18 actually requires companies to be active themselves and to prevent human rights violations, to know about their risks and to prevent them to have uh, grievance mechanisms and remedial mechanisms in place. And we think that this cannot be covered by controversies as, as it as we see them today. Um, on the other hand, um, we need external checks and we have worked them out. They do they are they are not they are different to what controversies mean today. And this is because we needed to find a way to um, use this external or to find external checks where investors would would lead which investors would lead to the same results for a company. So we couldn't point to um, media or other sources of information where investors would have to judge and to make value judgments on whether a company now is aligned or not. Um, but you would actually have to pinpoint to certain resources and certain results, which would in the end then be the same for all companies alike. <laughs> 
So finally, I would like to um, give you some ideas on how this advice can be applied to green bonds. For the first two lines, this is quite easy. Here, the issuer would be a company, and here, our advice for companies actually would apply. Um, and then we could, we had a look at green bonds issues by by sovereigns or sub sovereigns, um, and here we have a special advice on sub sovereigns, which Athena will explain to you in a minute. The most uh, difficult case would probably be banks. Um, here we said that banks are not the undertaking carrying out the activity. So the bank which is issuing a green bond does itself not have to be compliant with minimum safeguards. Um, we think that um, it's the entity which is receiving the loan or any other form of financing, which is undertaking carrying out the environmental activity. And this entity which receives the loan should meet the respective criteria. And this entity is either a company then the company criteria apply, or it's a, so a sub-sovereign or sovereign, and then the respective criteria apply. We also had a look at households. And um, here we say that minimum safeguards do not apply to households. This is quite important for green bonds, as there are often quite a lot of green household loans, mortgages, and so on in uh, green bonds. However, the documents of Article 18 do not apply to households. They apply to companies, they apply to sovereigns, but they do not apply to households. So minimum safeguards are not applicable to households. So, and now I'm handing on to Zena. Please carry on. Thank you, Anja. Yeah, so we thought it worthwhile to just uh, spend a few minutes uh, drilling down on this due diligence process, which is really at the heart of, uh, well, Article 18, but therefore also of the advice of the report. So many of you, or some of you will be familiar with this figure uh, developed by the OECD, which tries to uh, visualize in six steps what is meant uh, by this uh, due, di due diligence process. Um, importantly, uh, and different perhaps from uh, those that are, are mainly schooled in a uh, investor setting or, or financial tra transactional setting. Due diligence, when we talk about uh, human rights due diligence or due diligence on anti-corruption or other of these sustainability matter topics uh, is not a one-off uh, process that happens in the early stage of, let's say an investment decision, rather it's an iterative uh, process aiming to continuously identify impacts, uh, avoid and address them. So you'll see the six steps here, starting with step one uh, about committing to respect human rights and embedding such commitment throughout uh, the undertaking, uh, which is the, the language used in the ta taxonomy regulation. So embedding is about uh, budgeting, as Anja talked about, it's about uh, ensuring that processes is, uh, are implemented across relevant functions and are not siloed in one part of the company. It's about ensuring oversight uh, uh, of due diligence uh, processes and so on. And then you'll see in steps uh, two, three, four and five, uh, this uh, more or less cyclical uh, process of identifying impacts as a first step, assessing their severity, how serious are they, in, including where one needs to prioritize actions. Uh, moving on to the action uh, component, so taking action to prevent those that are potential impacts, those that are still risk at the risk stage, uh, but also uh, mitigate and remediate those that are actual impacts, uh, actual negative impacts on people's rights. Um, it has a step four tracking, uh, including to ensure that we don't implement a lot of uh, empty procedures that are not proving efficient. So tracking is a key component to actually follow up and see whether the uh, preventative uh, action plans or corrective actions that we have taken to close any uh, compliance gap are in fact uh, effective and are in fact changing these risks and impacts for people. And then finally, as a key component of the cycle is a communication requirement that companies not only uh, 
identify and are knowledgeable and take action on the risks that uh, are associated with the business, but that they can also communicate this externally, uh, including to those that are potentially affected. Those are the steps. And then there's, of course, a very critical component around remediation of actual impacts. Remediation is a human right in and of itself, uh, but it is also here a procedural component that you need to ensure access to remedy, including through having in place grievance mechanisms or complaints mechanisms where victims can raise any concerns and that, that companies can also use to actually provide remedy when they cause and contribute to negative impacts. So the, this is the system, if you would, uh, that is expected of uh, the minimum safeguards, uh, Article 18 documents, the UNGPs, but all, also the OECD guidelines. Uh, importantly, as you can see, uh, it focuses actually not just on the undertaking, but on impacts and those associated with uh, an undertaking's operations act and activities. This means that it can also uh, cover impacts that happen with business relationships across the value chain, both up and downstream. Uh, it can include impacts on the full spectrum of human rights. So it is not uh, specific to, let's say, labor rights or impacts on communities, but is a system that uh, requires of the undertaking to uh, consider impacts across the full board and then act on those that are relevant to the particular company. It also importantly stresses risks to people rather than risks to the business. And that is one of the, the challenges for those that will be new uh, to implementing this system, having uh, mechanisms in place uh, to make sure that uh, we can shift, uh, do a mind shift in the sense that companies are very uh, trained in assessing risks to the business. But here we need to assess risks to uh, people uh, stemming from uh, the business or linked with the business. Um, so important uh, kind of change in how we understand risk here and which risks we are trying to uh, manage. Uh, the report then talks about uh, adequate due diligence uh, processes and gives some advice around what can constitute uh, adequacy uh, or adequate uh, due diligence uh, systems. Uh, it does so including by uh, giving some examples or where of, of inadequacy, one could say, uh, including where, for instance, uh, a company um, fails to acknowledge, uh, including in its, its public communication, uh, risks that are very evidently linked to, uh, to its operations. So that could be through countries that it uh, operates in, it could be uh, risks that are very uh, familiar to the sector in question, um, or it could be risks that are linked to the business model of the, of the undertaking in question. For instance, in a case where it relies on 80% of, uh, of a precarious workforce, which is known to have a higher prevalence of human rights infringements. So the report gives some examples around how to understand this concept of adequate uh, due diligence processes. But otherwise, if you turn to the next slide. The report also uh, spends some time acknowledging that, as Antje already said, this is really an area where multiple regulations are currently underway and interlinked. Um, and so uh, you'll see the same six steps uh, th that we just went through on the previous slide um, are also the ones that are uh, embedded in the current uh, proposal that we have on, um, on uh, corporate sustainability due diligence directive. Of course, it's, it's a very early stage. And so we don't know how this file uh, will look like at the end. But at least as a starting point, there's, there's clear resemblance between uh, what we have in Article 18 documents and what we, we see in the proposal. Uh, similarly, if you turn to the next slide, when we look at uh, the CSRD, the, report, the reporting directive, both at the level one, so the directive text, but also at the level of granular uh, 
reporting standards that are currently out for consultation too, uh, in, in the form of these exposure drafts uh, from EFRAC, we also see that the same uh, due diligence uh, requirements and steps that are central to Article 18 also uh, are at the heart of, um, of, these, um, of this file and also how it is uh, becoming concrete through the, uh, the um, ESRSs. Of course, uh, as we all know, the devil is in the detail in a way. So although there is at the higher level uh, a high degree of overlap between the different files, the report also uh, cautions that of course, uh, this needs to be maintained, not only at the high level of, uh, of uh, sort of commitment to uh, these standards, but also in how concretely uh, these different files and reporting standards are developed so that alignment with uh, UN Guiding Principles OECD guidelines is maintained as far as possible, which will allow uh, these uh, two uh, files to, to maintain very relevant from an Article 18 perspective. Um, yeah, if you go to the next slide, there's of course the question about companies that are uh, non-EU, so that are not bound, uh, well, it could also be EU, but not bound uh, or covered by uh, the uh, CSRD or CSDDD, uh, but also non-EU companies um, or, or companies uh, until we wait for these files uh, to be in force. Uh, and here, as Anshu already mentioned, the report uh, points to methodology developed by the World Benchmarking Alliance that has uh, 12 indicators um, suggested as a way to measure um, and, and even benchmark uh, companies on their performance vis-a-vis -vis the UN guiding principles. So specifically on human rights, um, this is uh, pointed to as a way uh, to check uh, those companies that have already been assessed by the World Benchmarking Alliance themselves. I believe it's more than a thousand companies that are benchmarked, um, but also as a methodology uh, where this is not the case and where one, one uh, needs to look into uh, implementation or compliance with the minimum safeguards clause and, and one could do that through uh, applying these indicators. Um, yeah, finally, my last slide, I believe, is this case of sovereigns and sub-sovereigns that uh, Anche alluded to. Uh, this is a somewhat more tricky uh, endeavor, uh, given that the um, minimum safeguards uh, clause clearly talks about the undertaking and thereby refers to uh, most often a, a company. Uh, the same is the case for the UN Guiding Principles uh, and the OECD guidelines, acknowledging sort of the business uh, actor here. And of course, uh, in the case of uh, public lending, sovereign bonds, and so on, uh, the, the entity is a bit different here. Um, and that changes specifically uh, the perspective, specifically also when we uh, think about it from a human rights perspective, given that states are the primary duty bearers under international human rights law. So they have not only the responsibility to, to respect human rights, which, which is the responsibility of business, but also to uh, protect and promote human rights. Um, so uh, that is part of the context for the advice. Uh, the same, at the same time, we also in a, a, a situation where not all states or very few states meet all components of their duties under human rights law. Uh, so you can find human rights abuses in any state, of course, some more than other, and, and there's a variance in which rights are under which type of threat in different contexts. But essentially, uh, depending on how you would do your ranking, uh, all uh, countries would uh, come out with different human rights scores. And that leads me to a, a bullet that may maybe didn't make it onto the slide, but essentially one that is about data and, and usability here, because there are very limited uh, open source, uh, useful sort of open source data points uh, around kind of the performance of on human rights of sovereigns. Uh, there are ones within the UN system that evaluate countries uh, periodically on their human rights performance. 
but they are more qualitative in nature uh, and they don't result in, in sort of traffic light scores or, or any numerical value. So this, uh, these are some of the contextual challenges. Um, at the same time, there's no uh, existing uh, interpretation available of how would then we interpret uh, the responsibilities of sovereigns or sub-sovereigns, so the municipality or local government level under the UN guiding principles or the OECD guidelines. So there's nothing in sort of authoritatively to build the advice on uh, in terms of, of, of our report. So with that being the backdrop and the difficult context for the advice, uh, the report does take a stab at uh, suggesting indicators um, in the absence of, of perfect indicators. And one that it points to is the uh, that rather than looking at the performance of a human, uh, human rights performance of a given state or a sovereign, uh, it could look at the commitment of that state to being scrutinized on human rights and on its performance that it could do that through looking at uh, the existence of national human rights institutions uh, in a given context, uh, in a given national context. So national human rights institutions are uh, state mandated but state independent uh, institutions with, the, with a mandate to monitor the performance of a, of a, uh, of a given state and issue reports on, um, on the performance of, of the state and essentially therefore also criticize uh, the state for uh, where it has gaps in terms of it meeting its human rights commitments. These uh, national human rights institutions undergo uh, cyclical or periodic uh, accreditation under the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions and are accredited uh, with A or B levels according to their strength and independence and so on. So this is suggested as one indicator. Uh, the, the report also acknowledges important work from the fundamental rights agencies uh, agency in developing a framework on human rights for cities. Uh, so essentially trying to translate what we have from the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines, guidelines for businesses in a city context. So what would implementation by uh, a municipality look like uh, in terms of commitment, in terms of due diligence procedures, communication, impact assessment and so on. Uh, so that framework is available and we point to it as a good resource uh, for sub-sovereigns wanting to ensure compliance with minimum safeguards, but it is not a framework that currently is um, globally uh, rolled out or acknowledged or re results in any type of scoring or benchmarking of uh, the sub-sovereign level. But we do point to it as, as an interesting resource and want to follow also in the years to come in terms of potential relevance for, for minimum safeguards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zina. And I pass on to Wolfgang now. Thank you, Antje. Um, as Antje has described on the next page, if you aggregate uh, UN guiding principles and the fundamental principles of the ILO and the OECD guidelines, you get, of course, human rights and labor rights as um, mapped out by Sinje. Um, that is the very central part, but there's a few other topics that don't lend itself to be put into um, human and labor rights. You could probably do that with bribery and corruption, but you couldn't really with taxation and fair competition. So we decided um, to make sure that all three uh, have their bullet points so uh, not to fall by the wayside. There are two other topics that don't feature here uh, that are in the OECD guidelines, um, science and uh, technology, which doesn't really work as a minimum safeguard for enterprises. So they're not here. And then the environment, uh, which uh, because this taxonomy is all about the environment and uh, you have specific, um, do no significant harm guidelines that don't need to feature again in the minimum safeguards. So how this works is the OECD uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises provide the requirements um, and the um, ESRS uh, will provide the data. And I'll, uh, I'll show you that for all three topics. So the OECD guidelines under Roman numeral seven 
have two pages on bribery and corruption. And according to the guidelines, an enterprise should not directly or indirectly offer, promise, give, or demand a bribe or other undue advantage to obtain or retain business or other improper advantage, advantages. And uh, the guidelines also say you don't have that on the, the page. It would have made too many pages. The guidelines also say an undertaking should develop and adopt adequate internal controls, ethics, and compliance programs. So that's the text of the OECD. We're not making this up as a new criteria. This is just uh, what the, the document says. And um, in line with the two-pronged approach that um, Antje described, uh, one element that focuses on the process and another element that goes beyond the process and focuses on the, the requirement that the process is supposed to satisfy, uh, we uh, conclude that it should have two criteria. So the first criteria is that the company has developed it adopted adequate internal controls or phrasing it negatively has not developed and adopted uh, adequate internal controls ethics and compliance programs and second the undertaking or its senior management uh, including the the management of its subsidiaries has been convicted on corruption or bribery so if either of these uh, gets a tick then the subgroup recommends that a company should not be seen as fulfilling the minimum safeguards. Now, you'll ask where, how will we know, how do we get the information? And here, the quite new uh, European uh, Sustainable Reporting Standard exposure draft uh, very handily provides the information if it is then uh, taken up uh, as it is being proposed. For the first criteria, uh, the SRS say, the undertaking shall provide information about its system to track, investigate, and respond to allegations or incidents relating to corruption. So if uh, the company uh, falls under uh, CSRD, you should be able to find that information. And you should also find the second criteria, the undertaking shall provide information on legal proceedings related to corruption or bribery during the reporting period. For companies that don't fall under CSRD, uh, non-EU companies, or as long as CSRD doesn't uh, take effect, we would still recommend the uh, equivalent um, criteria. The information will probably be a bit more tricky to get by, but then a company that uh, wants to be seen as fulfilling minimum safeguards should be uh, willing to provide that information. Moving to tax uh, on the next page, tax is a little different because taxation doesn't get a mention either in uh, the uh, CSDDD or the ESRS, uh, which is very silent on, on tax issues, uh, probably because governments are very careful to, to touch this issue. However, we think nevertheless, um, it's possible to get the information from uh, uh, the ESRS when it comes to tax, the OECD guidelines say that the company should follow the letter and spirit of the law. It talks about um, discerning and following the intention of the legislature. And in order to make sure that's happening, an undertaking should treat tax governance and tax compliance as important elements of their oversight and broader risk management systems and adopt tax risk management strategies to ensure that financial uh, taxation are fully identified and evaluated, uh, the risks of those taxation rather. So uh, ESRS doesn't mention it. However, for both the um, uh, criteria uh, following the two-pronged approach, the first one, the company does not treat tax governance and compliance as an important element. If they don't, then they're not in line with what the OECD guidelines say. Also, if there's no adequate tax risk management system, again, the company wouldn't follow what the OECD prescribes. And a second, more outcome related criteria, the company has been finally convicted of tax evasion. Now, not as straightforward uh, as uh, for corruption to get the information. The ESRS are a bit broader, but still we think for the first A, A1A A and 1B, you could get it there and you should be able to because the ERS say the undertaking shall provide a list of the sustainable matters addressed by its governance bodies. So if on that list tax isn't there, uh, 
then you get a, a hunch that maybe the company isn't all, uh, all over tax as a uh, an impact um, element. And the same uh, for 1B. Does there exist uh, a tax risk management system? Well, according to the ESRS, uh, a company should uh, be able to describe uh, its processes with which with which it describes or deals with all the impacts, risks, and opportunities uh, that arise from uh, sustainability factors, and tax should be one of them. The information you're not getting from the ESRS is uh, whether a company has been convicted of tax evasion. Uh, hopefully, going forward, it will be easier to, to find that. But then, if a company is in line with the CSRD, probably a tax uh, evasion conviction should be reported somewhere. Uh, the subgroup uh, was careful because um, tax is a very technical uh, matter and uh, we couldn't fully conclude what kind of um, evictions, uh, sorry, not evictions, um, tax um, court decisions would fall under it. So it's conceivable that some more work needs to be done. We should also say that there is an emerging understanding of tax compliance, not just being tax evasion, but going further uh, and saying that uh, when it comes to tax, um, a company should follow the economic reality, uh, not just the letter of the law. So economic reality, meaning if you have uh, economic business in, your, uh, in a particular country, then tax should arise there as well. That is an emerging understanding, uh, but it's not yet in the OEC guidelines because the OECD guidelines are uh, a decade old. Um, however, uh, the subgroup couldn't just make it up or um, you know, come up with something that makes sense if it's not in the in the text. So unfortunately, it's not in there. Um, but we think uh, a company that wants to make sure that they uh, comply with minimum safeguards should probably be more ambitious than that in their reporting. And finally, competition on the next page, um, very similar to corruption, uh, two conditions. The company um, needs to carry out their activities in a manner consistent with all applicable competition laws in the language of OECD guidelines. And also the undertaking should regularly promote employee awareness of the importance of compliance with all applicable competition laws and regulations, which neatly fall into two criteria for minimum safeguards. The company does not promote employee awareness and the company or its senior management has been finally convicted for breaking competition laws. And uh, again, ESRS um, exposure uh, disclosure requirements very neatly ask that information from companies that fall under CSRD. The company shall provide information about its system to prevent and detect anti-competitive behavior. And the undertaking shall provide information on any publicly announced investigation or um, into or litigation concerning possible anti-competitive behavior. Um, so really, you should have it all there. Um, the only difficulty maybe or the, the most complex uh, topic uh, being the tax one but uh, when it comes to corruption and fair competition uh, ESRS uh, if it gets enacted uh, as suggested should have the information and with that um, back to Ankit. Yeah, thanks a lot to, to Zina and uh, Wolfgang and actually to the whole group for this work. Um, it was quite hard work in quite short um, time. We have been working on it for barely half a year. Well, thank you to all of you. And yeah, now I'm very ready and we are very ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Anja. I'd add my thanks and well done to you and to the group who worked so well and so quickly after the social taxonomy report. And if I may say in a way that closely collaborated with our usability and data group in the platform to work out how these recommendations could work in practice. And if I may say uh, to all the listeners, I think these set of recommendations show uh, a clear awareness of the need to support coherence between the different 
a European sustainable finance and corporate disclosure regimes. You see clear links here to the uh, sustainability, corporate sustainability due diligence disclosure directive uh, anticipated, uh, and of course, the work on European sustainability reporting standards. This is what the market's been telling us, and this report pays great attention to building on the work done in these other frameworks. So I think it's a very important point to draw everyone's attention to, and I just say well done for that. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in the chat, uh, and I'll also ask you some additional ones that I think arose from your remarks. Uh, the first one, which any of you can answer, is specifically is how are Indigenous rights violations addressed by the safeguards? Well, I pass this on to Zina. She's our human rights expert. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, they are uh, covered by the International Bill of Human Rights, but also uh, through the guiding principles, which have um, a particular principle that points out that when impacts associate with uh, other human rights standards, including in this case, Indigenous peoples have their own additional uh, rights recognized as a group, uh, and sometimes in situations of vulnerability. So Declaration 169 could come into play as a relevant benchmark for any undertaking that has a potential or actual impact on Indigenous people's rights. We know that to be the case in the context of the green transition uh, as a, an emerging uh, rights area um, where we need to be aware of some of the very land intensive um, projects and economic activities that can be part of uh, the green transition that could also impact uh, indigenous people's rights, including the right to free prior and informed consent, uh, but also more broadly on community rights uh, and on uh, land rights uh, and have result in impacts of uh, loss of livelihood, of uh, forced eviction, uh, um, relocation without compensation. These, sort, these sorts of uh, impacts are ones that uh, have been um, identified uh, as, as relevant to uh, solar projects, to hydro projects uh, and, and wind uh, projects and so on. And so are definitely ones uh, that are covered by the minimum safeguards and should be uh, identified where, where those are relevant for the particular also undertaking. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, are we aware of any initiatives to develop quantitative indexes for sovereigns on human rights performance. Um, maybe Zina might to add this, but um, uh, as I followed this um, in the first stage, we have looked at this. There are some, yes. The problem is they all look from a certain perspective on human rights. I mean, the one which is very widely used is the Freedom House indicators. Um, However, um, they, for example, do not cover access to medicine, access to shelter and housing, yeah, which are human rights as well. Uh, so especially the um, economic and social human rights are often not uh, covered by these indicators. Um, and, and in this situation, we thought it best to look for the national, the national human rights institutions where we would be sure that there is an institution in the country where, where people can apply to if the human rights are infringed. Uh, we thought that would be the widest answer to this question because all uh, the indicates that we had look at and we discussed this through quite thoroughly with, with, with FRA especially uh, are always, um, uh, well, can be, can be contested. Yeah, perhaps Zina might like to add to this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you just said. And then perhaps just to add that I know it's being discussed, you know, I know that responsible investors continue to struggle uh, with with um, sovereign bonds and that are, there are uh, webinars, emerging uh, guidance and, and focus working groups and so on that want to tackle ESG in, in a sovereign context, uh, but from, from that sort of level to, to pointing to one 
uh, useful, globally applicable uh, index uh, that, that we could use here, I, I think there's, there's still some steps to be taken. I know that within the UN system, there are uh, work being done to make uh, more accessible some of the um, uh, quite dense and valuable information that we have under the treaty body reviews uh, and the universal periodic review, which is every four year, every state in the world is is reviewed in terms of how it performs on human rights. But that is quite comprehensive, qualitative information. But it is being more and more, uh, it is more and more accessible, not just as lengthy PDF documents, but as databases where you can also search for uh, business and human rights uh, related abuses, uh, labor rights issues, indigenous peoples performance, and so on. So uh, I would I would point to that as relevant. Um, source for information, but it is uh, in no way a sort of uh, quantitative uh, benchmark uh, or index per se. Good, thank you. Uh, there is a comment on using the correct language uh, around adverse impacts, which we can note in the comments, thank you. And a question around OECD guidelines based environmental impacts that are not covered by the six areas. Uh, explicitly animal welfare, dust, light, and odour impacts. I'm just wondering, did we think about that explicitly or...? Yeah, we did yeah. think about it quite often. Um, and Nathan, it, it's a bit of a question to you, to be honest, yeah. Um, we have worked this out for the SG4, which is a subgroup on social taxonomy and social issues. We had brought a question on whether we need environment, uh, some elements on the environment and the minimum safeguards. And the platform as a whole said no. That, yeah. that was a decision by a platform as a whole. We as a social expert couldn't or did not found, found ourselves fit to, to work them out. Yeah, thanks, Anshu. I think that's the answer. And the rationale would have been that the environmental parameters, the platform are set by the explicit objectives taken up by the EU, and that's why they would have been taken up as the priority areas. Uh, so it's a fair question, but I, I think that the platform essentially decided not to go beyond its mandate on the environmental side uh, to discuss the minimum safeguard specifically and focus on the additional areas outside environmental requirements. All right, so going through the rest of the questions, uh, there's a practical question on where the safeguard should be assessed, at the level of the whole entity or a particular business activity? Well, the answer is clear here. Um, it's always the whole activity, as a whole entity. That is what Article 18 says explicitly, that it is an undertaking which is carrying out the environmental activity which has to comply with the minimum safeguards. It's very clear here. And that is a bit, uh, that's a difference to the other conditions in the taxonomy regulations, but it's very clear that there has to be the whole undertaking which is compliant with minimal safeguards. Thank you. The next question is regarding a litigation that's been subject to a settlement agreement. Would we consider <laughs> such agreement to be <laughs> consistent with a conviction? Yeah, there are still some open questions about this final conviction uh, um, advice we give. We, are sh we, we, we know about this. Uh, and so, because this question about settlements is one of them. Another question is what kind of uh, court cases actually uh, would fall under this criterion. Um, the reason is we just couldn't go further here. We just found that um, final conviction in court would be a clear signal of non-alignment. Uh, there has to be some more work on what is done with settlements, what kind of court cases are actually meant here, and so on. Good, thank you. The next question relates to the way minimum safeguards might play back into the SFDR. For example, could the minimum safeguards reporting under taxonomy be used to fulfill the requirements of the principal adverse impact indicators uh, within SFDR? Uh, 
A very interesting question. Of course, I would like this, <laughs> uh, uh, that our advice actually is taken up for the SFDR. Yeah, we don't say this explicitly, but I think that's possible. Mm, very good. It takes this you. advice for the SFDR as well. Yeah. yeah, good. It's a very insightful question. Thank you. Uh, yes. Can I can I come in with one question just on the pre, the previous uh, the question around entity versus economic activity and and, and minimum safeguards? Um, uh, I I fully agree with what Anche said, but what I think is also key here is that we don't think of those as two unrelated universes. So 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 clearly when we when we talk about uh, compliance at the level of the undertaking. That is not some headquarter exercise that needs to be deeply embedded in also the economic activities that are uh, the uh, at the heart of, of the given investment and so on. So, so there needs to be that underst understanding of due diligence as something decentralized, if you would, or something that is actively uh, targeting uh, impacts that are associated with the economic activity level. So that would just be one uh, additional uh, aspect or emphasis. And then uh, one more would be that the report does um, tackle the fact that uh, the table, I believe, that has come out as a um, a reporting structure or the table suggested under uh, Article 8 products uh, does uh, suggest that you would have sort of a minimum safeguards alignment check or disclosure at the economic activity level. And the report does uh, recognize that that is slightly confusing for the market and that maybe uh, one could, could improve that by uh, more clearly reflecting that this is a, a level of, the level of analysis is the undertaking level. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And I might go directly to question which has just popped up in this as an example where local law and the example of, is given in China but I'm not commenting on that specifically but that's the question stands against compliance with certain human rights for example freedom of association doesn't mean the whole undertaking and all of its activities could not be compliant with minimum safeguards and therefore reported as taxonomy aligned or only activities performed in that country who would like to start on this one? Um, this is about the UN guiding principles. In this case, if the activity uh, takes place in China or the company has activities in China, there's a clear human rights risks. Yes. And under the UN guiding principles and the six steps, the company will have to address this risk and will have to find means and ways um, to, um, uh, to alleviate it. Yeah. Um, so it's not an automatic exclusion of a company which does business in China, but China is clearly doing business in China. It's clearly a human rights risk, and we have to say, and the company has to say what it is doing about it. Thank you, Ancha, and I hope that answers the last question which just popped in as well, but maybe Senior wants to comment. Uh, if a subsidiary has a complaint, is the parent company implicated and therefore not seen as being able to meet the minimum safeguards? Yeah, I think on the latter one, it is uh, inclusive of subsidiary uh, companies. Uh, so, so that would be the case here that in, in my interpretation, but perhaps Anja wants to uh, con comment on that one too. I think on the first question around uh, where you are operating in a context where essentially compliance with the national law makes you at odds with international human rights. Um, that is not, I mean, now China came up as an example, but that, there can be examples of that in, in all corners of the world. Uh, the UNGPs do recognize that that's the reality of doing business globally, but also uh, puts the, as a requirement on business to work towards the higher standard. Uh, so not just, uh, let's say, resting uh, or even benefiting from uh, country contexts where uh, the state is failing its obligations <clears throat> for people under human rights law. Uh, so, so not essentially creating that type of race to the bottom, but uh, trying to meet the international human rights uh, principles. It could be, let's say, the, the, the example could be 
a context where freedom of association or unionization is uh, is against the law, uh, as it is in, in several countries in the world, what can the company do uh, to uh, offer alternative means of uh, communication between management and workers, worker committees, and other good examples uh, of trying to uh, address that risk at the operational level, whilst maybe using its leverage uh, to, to create uh, incentives and change uh, at the structural uh, industry level or even at the country level where this is possible. So we are um, uh, seeing that companies with more mature due diligence practices are acknowledging that it's not just about a very operational, what can we fix behind our own factory walls, but also acknowledging that some human rights risks are systemic uh, and uh, require companies to also as part of the response to the risk, uh, not just think about changes at the operational level, but how do companies become part of changes at the systemic level? Thank you, very good. And we, we now have a couple of questions asking how long should the conviction uh, assessment stand after the conviction occurs? Yeah, uh, this has been discussed thoroughly at the platform, but also in the subgroup. And we think that it is a bit arbitrary to attach a certain uh, length of time to a conviction. And, and we are not courts, we are not judges um, to, to hand out uh, convictions. But uh, we would say that if there is, um, uh, if the criteria are not met, for example, because there uh, is a final conviction or there's uh, no, co no um, uh, communication with the national contact point, then this is valid as long as the company has not improved its processes. Once the processes, the, according to the UN guiding principles, six steps, uh, are actually uh, implemented and fully implemented and make this violation less likely, the company is compliant again. And that can be on the day after the conviction, but it can also take years till this can, this has been implemented. It depends, but we, ha we have to see a system uh, and uh, an adequate system implemented, which makes it very unlikely that this breach is happening again in the future. Thank you. Now, there's a question here, which I think is an interesting one, uh, although it may be challenging to provide a satisfactory answer. Uh, and that is, uh, firstly, would it be possible to assess certain countries or sectors as being low risk such that any operations in those companies may automatically be deemed to be compliant. That's the first, that's actually the second part of the question, but the other part of the question maybe is a bit more challenging and that is, should the verification be outsourced to a final beneficiary? Now, I think the question doesn't state this, but presumably in respect of a financial product, it would be the buyer of the financial product. Uh, so basically, you, may, you have the requirement for disclosure, but performance would be assessed by the buyer of the product, I assume is what the question means, rather than the issuer of the product, which would pretty much flip the taxonomy idea on its head, I think, uh, would be a very different approach. But nonetheless, the question's been put. Yeah, actually, you have already given the answer to the second question, so <laughs> thank you for that. When it comes to low risk sectors, um, I haven't seen any list of this. Maybe Zina could uh, um, help here. And I, I always find it amazing uh, which kind of, well, even severe um, human rights risks actually uh, occur in sectors where you didn't think um, they would. Yeah, so I would be very cautious to say that there are low risk sectors. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I, I see what behind the question we probably find, um, or the question how it would be easier to to say a company is compliant, yes, or not, not compliant. And we try to do this with actually using the CSDD and saying, look, there's a law. And if this law is complied with, that would, it, it would at the same time mean that as a company is compliant with the minimum safeguards. And I, have, I struggle to find how we could make it even, even easier at this point. Mm. But Zina might say something on low risk sectors. Yeah, 
No, yeah, I would agree. There's there's no such thing per se. Of course, um, there are high risk sectors, and then if you flip that, maybe you could also identify some of those not on that list uh, as as lower risk. But we don't in the report or in our advice uh, take that route. Uh, neither at the country or at the sector uh, level. Uh, we have seen in the market that some do uh, take this approach of assuming compliance, let's say when we are operating within the EU, we assume that this is low risk given the high level of regulation in the EU. We, we caution against this approach also because we have seen uh, business and human rights abuses also occurring within uh, EU. So, so we should we we essentially uh, call for a more nuanced approach, acknowledging that the risks are simply different across regions, across countries, and across sectors. So, we need to uh, take a closer look at at the due diligence systems and also then at these a uh, few uh, examples of, of outcome performance that uh, that we recognize uh, could be uh, usable ways uh, given the current data available. Thank you. Uh, there's a question which goes to uh, company action versus having appropriate, uh, appropriately following the steps in our process to address uh, any failures or adverse impacts. So could a company knowingly violate, sorry, violates the wrong word, ref referring back to the earlier comment, um, could a company knowingly create an adverse impact but still be seen as compliant with the safeguards if they had the right processes and reporting in place? Is there any way for us to know that? I think I, I could imagine situations where that would be the case. But I pass this also on to Susania. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm following exactly what the 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 author might be uh, thinking of in terms of examples here. But um, but our our message is clear that these are not just. I mean, the the emphasis, of course, is on procedures here. We see the six steps, and 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 it looks familiar to, as as other types of management systems that we we are familiar with as businesses in terms of managing different risk. Uh, that said, this is not a just a procedural requirement. We talk about adequate due diligence, and when we say adequate, we also talk about the the outcome or the efficiency of due diligence procedures. So uh, we, we're concerned about the uh, the uh, ability of any due diligence system of actively avoiding and addressing uh, negative risks so, so or negative, negative impacts. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, a due diligence system that may on, on, the, on face value have the different six components but continues to produce the same types of impacts is clearly not adequate, is clearly not effective, and therefore the procedures are also not um, working as is, as was intended. So, so the report is pretty clear in, in talking about the need to not think about processes in the absence of performance, but, but as one collective whole uh, where processes are a way to, uh, to, uh, res to kind of um, result at a, a certain performance level. Yeah, but we also say, we also say that um, uh, there might be um, adverse impacts and um, still in spite of having a good uh, an adequate human rights diligence process, and that wouldn't automatically mean that a company is not aligned. Indeed, yes. So, so avoiding as the first uh, as the first goal here, right? To avoid impacts, but where they do occur, and they might occur even with the best of uh, processes in place, uh, we we look at the ability of the company to identify those impacts and and remedy the situation, including for for the victims. Thank you. Wolfgang, most of the questions have been to your colleagues, well, all in fact, but is there anything you would like to share? Um, I'd just say both to the length of the period until um, a certain infraction is healed um, and to the question, uh, is it possible that you have someone not complying, but um, it all looks good? Uh, I think that the proof is in the pudding. It's not possible to... 
assure everyone that uh, what's out there is or a company is necessarily uh, reporting in uh, in good faith but then that would be true for uh, do no significant harm as well um yeah. i think that's not the the point of the minimum safeguards to uh, uh become a, a a label um it is a criteria and uh, not in all cases will it be possible to get all of the information, but then um, you have the answer there if you can find it out. Otherwise, it's yeah, uh, uh, it's just unfortunate, but uh, there's nothing that can be done about that. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Anshu, I think we can start to prepare our concluding comments. There's one or two more questions, but I think they've started to slow down. Uh, I'll just address the question on the consultation period. Uh, the platform is not intending to extend its working period, and that's because the mandate of the platform ends at the end of September. There will be an ongoing platform role, of course, because it's in the taxonomy regulation, but we need to finish our work, and so we're not intending to extend the time frame. At least uh, there's no uh, plan for that, and it certainly wouldn't be material anyway because we have only a few days uh, to finalise this work after we get your feedback. We recognise it's difficult. Uh, we don't set the timelines. Uh, working on the platform, we respond to the timeline set for us within the mandate by the Commission. Uh, there is an additional question, which I'll pass on, and that is whether dealing with climate impacts might be considered a uh, safeguards issue rather than an environmental issue because of impacts on workers. Is this something we've considered? No, uh, we would probably have the same answer to this as to the question whether there would be environmental topics in the minimum safeguards addressed. Um, and here would we would say the same and say um, the um, uh, the activity-based uh, criteria for substantial contribution and do no significant harm actually cover climate. I mean, climate and even other uh, biodiversity as well and circular economy have big social impacts. Yeah, there, there, there's a clear link. However, in the taxonomy regulation um, and in the, in the taxonomy system, these are separated in the way that it's at the, the substantial contribution do no significant harm criteria actually uh, uh, focused on the activity and the minimum safeguards and the documents uh, under Article 18 uh, face uh, and focus on the um, on the undertaking which is carrying out the activity. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, aren't you? There are, of course, many other subjects which you could comment on regarding the potential implementation or the future implementation of this work. But uh, if there's anything you want to emphasise, I'd ask you to make it in your final comment, and I'll leave it in your hands if you wish to call for your final comment from our colleagues. Yeah, actually, I think the most important point with our advice is um, to strengthen um, the process part of human rights due diligence. Yes, to say that if a company wants to show that it is aligned with human rights, that it is taking human rights seriously, uh, it actually shouldn't weigh that there is some controversy or say that there is no con some controversy out there and that's why it's aligned. No, companies are aligned because they have implemented the six steps of the human principles and that should be the measurement for companies on human rights. So this, and this is, we, we, we know and acknowledge that this is quite new. We know that uh, only a few companies have actually implemented this. We see that more and more companies are taking this very seriously. Um, CSR uh, disclosures on human rights have been actually become much more. Companies are taking care of human rights and considering human rights much more than years ago. Um, so we think this advice comes into um, a situation where this is ta already taken up by companies and we actually would like to strengthen this process with this advice. Thank you, Archer. Any final comment from Senior or Wolfgang? No, 
Yeah, thank you, Nathan, for, for offering a, a last comment here. Perhaps just circling back to the opening remarks here that I think as we wait for CSRD and, and, and the underlying standards to be fully there, uh, as we wait for the CSDDD uh, file to develop, it's important to recognize that this is already in place and has been for a while. So any company that wants to claim taxonomy alignment or any investor that is serious about its uh, portfolio alignment should be thinking about the minimum safeguards piece. It's one out of three components uh, for taxonomy alignment, as we see with Article 3 of the regulation. So I think the, the report uh, offers some uh, cl uh, clarity around what it actually uh, entails and how it could work in practice. And I hope that the market will, uh, will, will look to it as we also wait for these other pieces of the regulatory puzzle to appear. Excellent. That's a great point. Thank you very much. Okay, well, then let's draw our session to a close. Thank you for joining us and giving a, an audience with very thoughtful questions uh, for this launch of the paper today for feedback. The links for the call for feedback and the paper can be found in the chat if you haven't yet been able to download them, or you can refer to the Platform on Sustainable Finance website. Thank you to Arncha. Thank you to Wolfgang. Thank you to Senior for your time today. Well done on the report. And we look forward to the final submission uh, in September. Thank yeah, you, everyone. And thank you for you. Thank you to you, Nathan and Christina and Wolfgang. And to you. Of course. Pleasure. And of course, to Climate Bonds Initiative, as always, for their support yes. for this event.